Talk Real Estate with Sharon McNamara, sponsored by Boston Connect Real Estate Services. Hi, I'm Sharon McNamara, and you are listening to Talk Real Estate Roundtable. Let me share a little bit about my background before we get started. I am the broker owner of Boston Connect Real Estate, a boutique real estate firm that is home to over 30 real estate sales and marketing consultants who service home buyers and home sellers throughout Boston, the South Shore, the South Coast, and Cape Cod. Our firm takes pride in assisting our clients in the next chapter of their lives by taking a holistic approach to their real estate endeavors. We believe that every move should be a moving experience. Every week, my real estate team member, Mary Baker, and I, along with the director of Boston Connect Real Estate, Melissa Wallace, provide you with our unique marketing approach to selling homes and share with you our expertise in navigating the home buying process. We like to mix it up sometimes, so not only will you hear our perspective on real estate topics, but you will hear the expert thoughts and opinions of some of our real estate agents at Boston Connect Real Estate and the preferred professionals that we trust. Be part of our roundtable. If you have any questions during the show, please call 781-837-4900. We'd love to talk real estate. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and wherever you listen to podcasts at Talk Real Estate Roundtable. If you would like a one-on-one consultation with me and my team or one of the dedicated agents at Boston Connect Real Estate to discuss your real estate needs, you can connect with us at bostonconnect.com or 781-826-8000. Now, sit back, relax, take good notes, and let's talk real estate. And hello to our South Shore neighbors. You are listening to Talk Real Estate Roundtable. Um, This is going to be a really interesting show tonight, a really special show, because I, Mary Baker, am the only hosting person right now, and they left the controls to me. So I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking, but we are going to be talking about real estate investing and all of the things that you should be thinking about when you're considering investing. We have some pretty awesome guests, if I do say so myself. Mark Stiles, I'm going to go to you first. Um, so we have Mark Stiles from Stiles Law, and he's joining us um, via Zoom, right, from New Hampshire. Yes, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be really fun. Thank you for joining us, as always. We always love to have you. Um, I know how much you love to talk, and you... you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you. No, you bring up some really good points when we're... Um, we did another show... I think it was almost two years ago now, and I remember you were just asking me very prompting questions, and I was like, wow, I never kind of thought about it like that. (laughs) Um, And then we have in studio Samuel Horton. Samuel, um, full name. Samuel Horton, um, who is a full-time real estate agent here at Boston Connect Real Estate, as well as my not-so-better half, my fiancé. So he has been wanting to get me in a room alone and talk to me about real estate investing for two years now at least and i kind of run away at almost least. almost all the time so now's your chance you have me locked up in a room with mark as as your witness so i'm going to be all ears with you guys for the next 45 minutes and i'm going to prompt you you can tell me all about it and hopefully we're going to give you guys some really awesome information i have a question for you though mary oh geez what are you afraid of with real estate investing Oh, we're going to find out. You're going to see me. Get, <laughs> we're going to find out. We're going to see me get bright red. I'm probably afraid of what everybody else is afraid of. So, What's that? So, making a bad business decision. If we can, if I can do it, if it's financially feasible. Um, but, but so before we really get into our topic, I just want to let everybody know. So we're actually streaming on Instagram live right now on Sharon. Um, I think it's McNamara Broker Team. So you can catch us there. We're also on Facebook live on McNamara Broker Team, Sharon Costa McNamara, um, all of the Pembroke Connect, Pembroke Connect pages, uh, Dorchester Connect, any of the Connect pages that you can think of. Um, and I'm sure we'll, ha- we'll be on the podcast after the radio show. And if you guys have any questions tonight, feel free. I'm the worst person at this one. But if you have any questions, you want to call in. Um, George is in studio, and he will patch you right on through to us. The number he- for here is 781-837-4900. And you can feel free to um, aim your questions towards Mark and Sam for tonight. <laughs> um, so what am I um, – How do we, where do we want to start here, guys? So – Mark, I'm going to let you introduce yourself first, even, ev- even though everybody knows you. No, they don't. Yeah, I think they, they don't, do. But I appreciate that very much. My name is Mark Stiles. I have a law firm in Marshfield on State Road 
139. And for the ATD listeners, you will may have heard my voice before. I do advertise on this wonderful station. And I am the guest on Feel Good Friday every morning with every Friday morning with Rob Hakala. We have a lot of fun there. And I am also the co-host of the Dr. Joe show. But more importantly than anything, I am also a real estate investor. So I can't wait to share some of my knowledge, experience, and maybe some failures tonight and uh, and some of the ones that we've had with our clients. So I'm looking forward to this because one of the things um, I always say about real estate when people say, when's the best time to buy? When's the best time to buy? And I always answer them, 10 years ago. <laughs> well, we can't and go then back I, time. We they say, well, machine. when's the next t- best time to buy? Right now. Yeah. Right now. And I'll tell you, Mary, one of the things you said, you said, you know, the anxiety and the nerves of making a mistake. One of my longtime clients who I've had for over 20 years has a massive real estate portfolio. And he always shared with me this little bit of wisdom. Yeah. That when it comes to real estate, any mistake that you make is always, always cured with time. That's very true, though. That's that's even real estate, residential real estate. So I feel like maybe this, this is why the show will be good for me, because I'm comfortable in residential. Like, that's that's my hub. That's what I know. I feel like I literally eat, breathe, sleep residential real estate, whereas I really do think real estate investing is a completely different beast. And I've, it, it's just... It's so foreign to me. Um, but why? It's you're buying residential real estate and you're housing people who need housing and you're creating a business where you have customers that you take very good care of and they're happy. And guess what? They're building your net worth. It's, it's just another service business, right? At the end of the day. Yeah. And it's in an industry that you already know. Okay, guys. Well, you're going to make me... <laughs> Let's go, Mary. You're going to make me get really, really comfortable here. Um, don't don't give me too many probing questions. Um, Sam, I'm going to let you introduce yourself just real quick and kind of how sure. long you've been in the business, how long, um, what you've been doing, especially over the past couple of years. I want you to talk about your networking events that you do. Sure. So um, my name is Sam Horton. I've been a real estate agent with Boston Connect for about eight years now. Um, prior to that, I actually worked for uh, appraisal management company. So I've been in the real estate business for about 10 years collectively. Um, and I do host uh, a South Shore networking event, meetup, if you will, for real estate investors. Um, the next one actually is March 24th in the office here at Boston Connect Real Estate. Um, we usually have a good turnout there, and there's usually a whole plethora, plethora, thank you, <laughs> of different types of investors from uh, mobile homes to uh, warehouses to single family to short term, long term, so we can get into all the the fun stuff tonight. Yeah, I think that's, so there's so many different ways to invest that I think that's also a reason that I always get a little bit um, nervous about it because yeah, everybody thinks, okay, well, I want to find an investment property. It's in my mind, I'm thinking very singularly. I'm, I'm okay, well, let's find you a multifamily so you can rent out a unit. So, or live in, live in the unit and rent out, you know, the second unit, rent out the third unit. So we call that a house hack. Just house so hack. Aware. Okay. So that's a new word for us. So that's house hacking, everybody. Um, but there's so many other facets to it. And like you said, Mark, earlier, building a portfolio, a portfolio, like a good one, as far as I'm aware, you have kind of your hands in multiple different pots, right? It's almost like investing in the stock market. You don't want all of your stocks to be in just single families, potentially, or just multifamilies. Right. It depends. You know, it depends what your appetite is. I mean, folks can invest in, you know, single family condominium units. They can. I, I love the the house hack idea, Sam. I mean, anybody who is getting into real estate at the at the very beginning, it's a brilliant way to start. Right. You have someone paying your rent to help you pay your mortgage and the house hack. There you go. But, you know, the single family three family, four family, two family, condo, you know, it's all about taking care of the people, right? It's mm-hmm. taking care of your customers and making sure the tenants, your customers have a nice experience there and how you do that. You know, a lot of, you know, folks talk about real estate investing and being very passive, right? You're getting passive income. Well, it's yeah. only passive if you hire a management company because it is a job Mm -hmm. if you don't. And if it works for you, 
it works. Now, one of the things we always hear is I don't want to get into being a, a, a landlord because I don't want to get that phone call at midnight that the toilet is clogged. Mm -hmm. It never happens. I think that's me. Ever. I think it never me. happens because the people are going to wait until eight in the morning to call you, for, first of all. Oh, well, that's and fine. second of all, you know, most people know how to unclog a toilet. But if you have the margin, if you have the ability to have a management company, I don't think there's a better way to grow your net worth than to have real estate with tenants paying your mortgage and it's hands off. So it's a spreadsheet business at that point. Obviously, you want to have a representative in management that, you know, follows your value set, that these are customers, these are human beings that you're providing housing for and you want them to have an amazing experience. You don't want them to be treating your customers badly because then it will reflect on you. It will reflect on your bottom line. There's no question about it because you'll have vacancies and mm -hmm. that's what you don't want when you're, you know, running a business. Absolutely. Um, so in, in that's kind of, in my opinion, so covering why real estate investing is such a, uh, like a great way to increase your net worth. So Let's just kind of go back to the very, very basics for everybody, and we'll start to really get into the nitty gritty of the topic. But um, that is a good point. So getting yourself comfortable, have it, starting to have the conversations, and truly um, the fastest growing. And I think maybe, Sam, you know the stat right off the top of your head about what was it like 8%? It was the fastest growing real estate investing was one of the fastest growing ways to increase your net worth. What was the percentage? Well, that, over the last eight years, they've said that real estate is the best investment that you can make. Just yeah. because, of, because of appreciation, the tax benefits, and everything else involved with real estate yeah. investing. And then, and then another stat that I like to throw out there is economists are predicting that over the next 10 years or so, um, that we're going to have about a billion people working from home. So if you can work from home and you can work anywhere, that's where <laughs> short-term rental comes into play. And you can rent a property up in Maine where someone can rent it out for a month because they can work from anywhere and enjoy the backwoods of Maine while still being able to earn money. So I think that's really exciting stuff too. So maybe that's like the future of where a lot of real estate investing could potentially be going? I think it's a very hot area right now is short-term rentals Okay. personally. but Okay. All right. Food for thought. I'm going to write that down. Um, so getting, so just the very basics, what, what different types of real estate investment properties are there? Like, so what are your different types? List them out for me. Well, you've got residential, right? Okay. You've got commercial so family. You can, you have office, you have retail, you have flex industrial, right? Amazon, right? If you want to be one mile away from dropping people off, you know, dropping packages, you've got those Amazon. You've got uh, multifamily residential, uh, you know, from two family to 148 units. You've got, um, you know, hotel. You've got, you know, hospitality. There's a lot of different ways to invest. And you can invest in, you know, what I assume we were talking about is the residential where you have tenants. But you can invest into REITs, right, a real estate investment trust, the publicly mm -hmm. traded. You can invest in uh, private equity that builds uh, portfolios of, of office and hotel and, and retail. Um, but for, you know, the listeners and people like ourselves, you know, investing in residential real estate to provide housing for other people, you know, I would echo what Sam said, but way more than eight years, you know, I mean, for the last 50 years, you know, real estate has been on an amazing uptick, you know, mm -hmm. yes, there's speed bumps here and there. But if you were to look at a graph from the last 60 years, I don't think there's any asset class that has appreciated the way real estate has, along with what a lot of people don't really take into consideration is the ability to leverage that, right? So you, you buy a property for $500,000, you borrow $430,000, yeah. Right. But every year your four hundred and thirty thousand dollars is going down at the same time as that five hundred is going up. So you create this spread, this delta that is an amazing accumulator of wealth that I, I think people miss out on. And if they're not investing in real estate, they miss out on that opportunity because a lot of people see it with their principal residence. And that's great. But imagine if you could multiply that. 
Very true. I would agree with that. And then what you what you kind of see with the the residential non investor is they'll they may capture that equity, right? And then use it to update their house, which is totally fine. But in the real estate investing world, we can use that to go find two, three, four more properties. Right. And that's where the leverage comes in. So it's it's huge. Right. And then you could start talking about, you know, 1031 exchanges and you can defer. Oh, I capital have that gains. on my list because I remember you talked to me about that once. Delaware trusts are also very interesting too. Okay, um, you guys are all over the place. I feel <laughs> sorry, like sorry. I, f- I feel like you're talking way above my pay grade here. Well, um, dial it back. Where do you want us to talk? Well, so okay, so you we ha- obviously there's a multitude of a plethora of different ways that you can really get into real estate investing. But if we're going to dial it back to your single families or your multi families or your short term rentals. So what is probably, so the most common being um, multifamilies? Would we say that's pretty accurate and or single family flips? So those are two are probably the most common ways to get started in real estate investing? Yeah, so flipping, flipping's a job, right? That's an occupation. That's not necessarily real estate investing, right? That is somebody who is using real estate to create short-term income as opposed to the long game of buying and holding a property. Now, flipping properties is great. It's not great right now uh, because there's not a lot of flipping opportunities. So a lot of the folks that we have represented in the past that quote flip properties, I like to, I like to call it recycling homes. Mm -hmm. Um, They, you know, they're not very busy right now. But there's always opportunities to buy investment properties because if you're looking for the long term, then you're not trying to time the market, right? Where flipping a property, you know, you really have to get it at a discount for it to work because you are going to add value to that discounted price and hopefully make a profit on it. But that's more of an occupation, right? Because you're counting on that income to survive as opposed to having a portfolio of investment properties that you're building kind of like a 401k, right? Kind of like a retirement plan that's building and accumulating equity so that at some point in time, you know, you can utilize that and, you know, and and reap the rewards of it. Now, if you build a portfolio large enough, then, you know, you could generate income out of that on a monthly basis and you could live on that also, but that takes Isn't time. That like you have goal? to build and you have to identify the proper uh, asset that's going to work for you. Mm-hmm. Right. So again, you don't have to buy it at a discount for it to work. When you're flipping it, you really need to find a distressed property that has an opportunity to value add, right. To, to add some value to it, to then put it on the retail market and make, make a profit. So, but so- those are hard to find right now. Yeah, harder to find. But I know, Sam, so you've worked with actually a, a couple of people who in the past year have been able to flip properties. So, and I think that's one of the most common ways that I think the beginner investor, somebody who's trying to get build some maybe quick money or cash flow so that they can take that money and then put it into the next investment, that's maybe their first thought. Where are they finding those properties? Like, how are they finding those properties? Be like, like Mark said, you know, they're hard to come by. Yeah. So how are you finding them? So to Mark's point, the, the flipping is like active income, right? So you're only as good as your last flip. You have to put the energy and effort into it to actually create that capital from the from the flip. Um, whereas if you invest in like a long-term rental or even short-term, you're creating hopefully a passive income. So you're not working as much on the property, but still generating cash flow from the property. Um, as far as like finding off market, well, sorry, that I just led led myself into it. The best way to find a flip property, if you will, would be off market. Um, a lot of uh, the investors that I work with will, ha- and myself included, will associate with wholesalers, which we can get into. But it's 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 basically That's a completely different beast. Yeah, if I, it, if it's I understand, it's all off market. It's 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 kind of almost like a mini real estate agent where they go out and talk to s- homeowners. They try and negotiate a deal off market and then assign that contract to a flipper, and that's and they usually charge some sort of wholesale fee involved with that. But a lot okay, of we'll touch that on another day. Yeah, a lot of the <laughs> the the flippers, so to speak, that I've worked with have been finding these these deals off market. So not going through the traditional means of MLS or Zillow or Realtor.com to find these properties. They're going through wholesalers or simply sending out postcards to 
homeowners and stuff like that, trying to reach someone before they speak to a real estate agent or someone like that. Yeah, so potentially word of mouth, like somebody Correct. knows somebody who knows somebody who just had a bad experience with real estate agents or, I mean, we've talked about that on the show before, or just doesn't want to go through the hassle of having people come through a distressed property, doesn't want to, you know, invest the time, energy, and money into doing certain renovations that might be required to go on market. They just try and sell it to somebody kind of cash and Correct. let their hands go. I would say a lot of times it's probate. It's a large family that just wants to be done with the property. Or if there's a septic issue, a lot of times uh, homeowners will get a little intimidated by that and they'll think, okay, I have to go to a cash buyer. What are my options? And they won't go to list it and they'll try and find a cash buyer. And that could be a flipper or a wholesaler, someone like that to kind of gain access to that property. That said, it is still very hard to find those deals. It's not very easy. Yeah. Um, they're few and far between for sure. Absolutely. So maybe, an, so an advantage to flipping is um, if you do it the right way, there is a big cash output at the end, right? Ideally. There should be, there should, should be, or they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. Right. But again, as Sam was saying, they're, they're really hard to find. So and you know, it, 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 it ends up, it's a lot of times it's a, a person in distress, right? Because there's some financial hardship for it. So there's that you know, mental piece to overcome, right? How are you helping this person or are you taking advantage of this yeah. person, right? And there's investors that are taking advantage of people and then there's investors that are that are helping people move yeah. along and, and get, you know, let the dust settle. Um, but a lot of people, you know, there are hoarders, right? There are a lot of people who simply can't fathom the idea of having an open house and showing their house to the general public. And this is an easier, faster, smoother way to make that transition when an investor comes in and says, you know what, just take what you really want. Don't worry about anything else. Don't worry about the septic system. I'll take care of that. Don't worry about all of this extra stuff that you have. We will take care of it. We will, in fact, make sure it gets to a good home. You know, we're not just going to throw it in a dumpster. We're going to get it to, you know, we're going to get all this closed to another secondhand place. And, you know, there are really, you know, nice, genteel ways to work with somebody who's in a distressed situation. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is, you know, a real estate agent isn't going to be able to put that house on the market because of the extenuating circumstances. Yeah. You know, you, you brought up a, a very good point of the financial cost of bringing your house to the market, right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Now in this marketplace right now, you know, with the opportunities of the renovation loans, there's a lot of first time home buyers that would say, you know what, this is the perfect neighborhood. This yeah. is where we want to be. I don't care what shape it's in. We're going to get a renovation loan. We're going to get a contractor involved and we're going to buy that house and they can get a lot closer to the retail price. But a lot of people aren't aware of that. So, you know, the investor approaches them and says, you know, I'll give you this. And it's still a really big dollar amount because of the way prices have accelerated. So, extraordinarily um, that it's an easy, smooth transition. Well, I think that's where we get all of that. Um, we buy ugly houses or, yeah. or the, we'll buy your house cash. Um, you know, though when you, when you were talking about people giving flyers, a lot of people, a lot of homeowners may, who are in that distress situation may not know that they have other options that they're like, we have to go to somebody who's going to, you know, offer us a minimum, but they're going to give us cash and we're going to get out of it. Maybe they, yeah. have, they have the um, knowledge, but still don't think that they have any other options. Well, obviously we're talking tonight and you do. Um, so that's, so covering flipping. So what's the advantage of holding? So what does it mean when you're holding an investment property? You're keeping it in your portfolio. So what we like to talk to people about all the time and uh, it was taken from an amazing podcast, uh, Bigger Pockets. I'm sure Sam's aware of Bigger Pockets podcast. Oh, yeah. But the I've Burr, been, the Burr methodology, right? Yes. Buy it, rehab it, right? Okay. Rent it. Okay. Refinance it, repeat, right? And then you get the benefit of, you know, buying something that you can add value to. You could put somebody in as a housing. You get your cash back out of it through the refinance. And then you repeat, you know, you take that money Sam was talking about, you take that money out of that house and you put it into another one. And hopefully if everything works out well, you're still covering and making money on that first house. And now you've got capital to go to the next house. And then all of a sudden you've got 10 houses and they're all paying you income 
that exceeds the cost. And all of a sudden you're in it, you are in it. So that's really how you're building, like maybe one of the quickest ways to build, or I wouldn't say quickest cause I know nothing, but and it, <laughs> oh, I know nothing, a way to um, build your portfolio would be this Burr method. Yeah, without a doubt. I yeah. think it's a brilliant strategy, a brilliant strategy. I know Sam's been trying, he, he came home the other day and he's like, babe, Burr. I'm like, Burr. what does that mean? What is that? I, I don't, I'm, I'm in bed. It's 930. I'm trying to close my eyes. He's like, no, this is how we're going to do it. This is what's going to happen. I'm like, okay, we can talk about this at a later this time. This wasn't just one time that I've said this. I'm before. sure it's been years. <laughs> yeah. I get it. Yeah. But it is, it's a great strategy. So if you think about it, you know, you're buying it, you're rehabbing. So there's probably some level of value add there, right? So you're buying it at maybe a discount, you know, but again, in real estate investing, you do not have to buy it at a discount. You know, it's yeah. better. Obviously, you're going to, you know, make out better faster. But if you're in it for the long haul and the numbers work, right, you need to be a spreadsheet person, right? You need to know all of the costs associated with owning. Yeah, mm-hmm. there it is. So you got to get yeah. partnership there. You, yeah. you, you know, you're ready, you guys. You know, and one of the things we always talk about with real estate investors is, you know, the number one thing people don't do is start. You know, you got to start. Yep. 100%. Babe, we got to start. Sam, we got to start. I mean, getting your foot in the door. So the Burr is a great method. We talked about house hacking earlier, which is another great meth- method. Yeah. We miss, kind of missed. Well, we actually are kind of doing that right now. We do rent out one room. Uh, shout out to Melissa. <laughs> and uh, and that is technically a house hack because we're renting yeah. out a room. So you could take a single family house and rent out one room, two room, three rooms, or you could, again, buy a multifamily, two family, three family, and rent out one of the other units or two of the other units um, and go from there. And that's the best way to get started in my mind is is for somebody who, you know, is, is digging in and they want to invest. They get their, because when they move out, they've got a two family, a three family, right? Yes. They still have that income if they can hold on to it, if they have the strength to hold on to it. Um, I'm just going to jump in as Mary and Sam's tenant. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do rent a room in their house. Uh, but if you have any questions for Mark Stiles or Sam Horton or Mary Baker, because I'm going to slip not out me. after this. Uh, yeah, maybe not Mary. S- Sam Sam or, or Mark. Uh, you can call the studio at 781-837-4900. Again, 781-837-4900. And Mary, make sure that you let them have enough time at the end of the show to give their contact information because they are really smart. I almost said wicked, but here, they're wicked smart about all this stuff. So <laughs> Um, be sure to to give your contact information. Okay, guys, did I buy you that shirt? Maybe. I think I bought that shirt for Sam. Okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, so, how are? Let's talk about finance for a minute. Um, yeah. What are the different ways that? And I'm sure there are many. Um, but what are the different ways that you could be financing or purchasing these investment properties? Say you have. Um, you're starting out with nothing. Let's take just take that scenario. So your first house that's looking like a house hack, right? Could be, or if you- So a conventional yeah. loan. Yep. Conventional loan, you don't, you can purchase it with 5% down, even a multifamily, right? If you can get away with it, go with the FHA and you can get a three and a half percent down. So you have less principal in the property and then you can hopefully cash flow sooner and then move on to the next one because you put less down. If you put a full 20% down, then you're tying up all your money in that property. Okay. And you're hoping for appreciation to get so back. So that's in the scenario where you're just starting out. You don't have a house. You don't have any other assets. You're just trying to to get your foot foot in the door. Um, you live in one side, rent out the other side. I'm just trying to like bring it down to my level for everybody out there. That's how I have to really wrap my head around it. And then, so what are the options if you have you maybe don't have any type of cash flow coming in, but you have an asset of a single family home? Or any type of other asset. So you're looking to buy it as an investment or you're going to live in that property? You're going to buy it as an investment. You're not going to live in it. So what are our so, finance options there? So there are ways, right? So you can buy with very little money, but I will say this, that you're probably going to need some level of skin in the game regardless of how you do it. But there's a there's a whole industry called hard money, mm-hmm. right? It's p- private financed money. The interest rates are a lot higher than 
they would be if you were to go to a conventional loan like Sam's talking about. So you wouldn't be able to use an FHA loan if you were uh, buying it as an investment because FHA wants you to live in the house. But yep. as Sam was talking about with the hack, right? You get a two family or a three family, that might be a really, really powerful way to do it is to get a low down payment um, and and it is your primary residence at that point, and you have the other folks uh, paying you rent. Mm -hmm. But private money, you're not going to be able to move into it either. There, that is for um, for business purposes only, right? So you're borrowing the money to probably flip it, right? So a private lender, you're 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 not going to want to stay in a loan that's 10, 11 percent with you know certain amount of points associated with it. Uh, but it is a way to start, right? Partners is another way, right? If you have people who are in the business and you okay. bring them into a deal, you can partner up with them. You know, you could get loans. You could, you know, depending on, you know, your situation with family, you might be able to get a gift of equity, right? Mm -hmm. You might be able to get some level of a gift. Um, but there are ways. Um, I know, Sam, you talk about wholesaling a little bit. Those are strategies that, you know, takes this to another level. But um, there are ways, but you have to kind of dig in and, and, and understand what you want to do. But chances are you're going to need to save up some money first because it's very hard, even though you hear it on the radio or you go to a weekend seminar, you can get in with no money down. It's, it's almost too good to be true. It's really um, not something that many people can, uh, can uh, execute on. Yeah. Mark, um, I'm going to interrupt you real quick because I think I heard George say we have a caller. George, do we have a caller? Yes, we do. Oh, awesome. Who do we have? We have Tom from Kingston. Tom from Kingston. Thank you for calling in, Tom. How are you? Good. Who's this? This is Mary. Hi, Mary. I'm the one who doesn't really talk on the show. Well, it's, it's kind of strange. I said, wait a minute, whoever it is, it still talks just as fast as Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> i got to slow down. <laughs> so i got a couple questions. Um, sure. Who are, are they for? Are they for Mark or for Sam? Well, whoever wants oh, the answer, the who crowd. might have the right answer for this. Okay. When you're a we'll newbie and you want to get involved with the real estate, like we're talking about, how do you find these uh, locations that will lend you the money when you're not doing conventional Number one. Okay, no, so you, you don't you don't want to pay PMI. You don't want to go to the local credit union or local bank because of their guidelines. How do you find somebody that will front you the money? Like you said, you're going to pay a higher rate. You're looking at eleven, twelve percent, or whatever it may be. So, where do you find these people that's willing to help out? So find so finding uh, somebody who's willing. So hard money is still a loan, if I'm understanding correctly. It's a it's yes. a hard money loan. Yes, um, correct. With a mortgage, with a note. Where do you yep, find so, those people? Yeah, where do you find them? Um, so, uh, Tom, this is Sam. Um, there's Hi, Sam. there's a few different ways. I'm a bit high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a big uh, fan of networking. I like meeting people. So one of the ways mm -hmm. I do it is go to like local RIA groups, which is real estate investment associations. Um, okay. And I try and meet people there. And there's nine times out of 10, there's always a lender there. There's always someone that you can talk to that will have some sort of um, idea as to how you can get into the business. Um, mm -hmm. Another good resource, in my opinion, is looking for like an agent like myself or someone that is focused on real estate investing because we'll have we'll go to those networking events on your behalf and look for those business cards and try and make those uh, oh, introductions. Okay. Um, and then, I'll, you know, I'm sure Mark has a couple ideas as well, but those are the kind of the two that I, at least I use to find those types of lenders. Okay. It, it's usually a, um, a niche group of people that, you know, it's, they don't really advertise. Um, it's very much word of mouth. Um, and it's a relatively uh, wild west, unregulated kind of uh, lending. Sure. Um, it has to be sophisticated borrowers who really understand what they're doing because the numbers, they're challenging. They're very challenging. Your finance becomes your partner um, and you need to move very quickly uh, in order to minimize the, the outlay of that, of that loan. But it is a way to start. And it's a way if you're flipping and you've got a spreadsheet and it, the numbers work, it's fast and it's really easy as opposed to going to a bank, which 
they're probably not going to lend to you on a flip short term because it doesn't make sense for them. Right. But there are there is another uh, loan product that is is making its way uh, out there. It's called a non QM, a non qualified mortgage. Wow. Um, qualified mortgages it came into play in about in 2013 after the mortgage meltdown, mm-hmm. and it basically said, you know, no more subprime. We need to have qualified mortgages with qualified borrowers. Otherwise, you know, the, the loan will be rejected as, as non-compliant. Okay. Regulations have loosened up and they're allowing what's called a non-qualified mortgage, a non-QM loan that allows people to borrow based on the asset as opposed to the individual. So again, interest okay. rates are a little bit higher, um, but they're qualifying more on the loan and they're a lot less than a... Um, uh, uh, a hard money loan. The, the difference there is, again, talking about the FHA and the house hacking, typically you need to move into the property, but there are loans that allow you as an investor to buy as an investment, and then they're running it based on the rental income. So uh, I think you all had Pete Fakaisen from Luxury Mortgage in your office talking about we the did. non-QM loans. Yeah, and, we did. Uh, he's a great resource for those, and you know, is, mm. is really he's on top of the game because it's a new product that's coming into the market. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Um, and I think we're going to see it a lot in the investor world too, where there's sophisticated borrowers, you know, understand the, the, you know, the need for a product that yes, you're going to pay a little bit more for, but you know, it's, it's different. You're not going to be um, scrutinized as you would be for a conventional loan. You know, so when you credit say a isn't more, as important, the 11, 12, um, you know, the yeah, assets yeah. that you have, the so, debt to income ratios are based yeah. more on the asset and what that asset can generate and the asset being the piece of property that you're buying. Yeah. So cool. I don't know. So I know Mark was talking, um, Tom, I heard your question kind of in the middle. Um, I don't know for the non QM loan, what their more, their interest rates are running. Um, but for hard money, I know Mark was talking maybe like 11, 12% for a hard money loan. Um, yeah. but we can always get you that information of what the non QM loans are running. And I think the whatever program, if I understood Pipa Kaizen's presentation the other day, he came to Boston Connect Real Estate. Um, and he's from Luxury Mortgage Group, which is just right where you are, right, Mark? Yep. Yep. Um, he was Uh-oh. talking about, um, <laughs> he was talking about different types of loans would have different types of interest rates or, or they would kind of vary, right? Yeah. I, I think, don't quote me on this, Tom, but I think it was like about a point more for the non-QM loan versus a conventional loan. And right. then like like Mark was saying with the hard money, that can be anywhere between 8 to 14% and a couple points on the loan itself. Hey, Mary. But again, the hard money is Mark, you cannot on live in it. Mark, hold where... on one second. What'd you say, Tom? Uh, for your own information, before you were born, Back in the 70s, mortgage rates at that time were anywhere from 9% to 14%. Oh, so the ones that, when we talk about the interest rates rising right now, you're like, psh, I've been there. Oh, you have. We're talking about going up to 4%, and this is nothing to you. <laughs> right, because had, I had to put 20% down to get the interest rate down to uh, 9%. That was back Crazy. in 1976, Bicentennial. Well, we're going to knock on wood that we're not going to see that anytime soon. <laughs> Amen on that. Great information. Um, it's a great show. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate it. Is that, is, did, you, did you have any other questions for us? Are you, you no, good? that's great. Thank you. I'll be listening. Awesome. Guys, have Thanks, a good Tom. Week. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Mark, if you still remember your your thought there, sorry to cut you off. I just wanted so to... What I, what I was saying is that you know when you're dealing with hard money lending, part of the industry is you are not allowed to move into it. Like you can't get a hard money loan and, and use that as your primary residence. So the lenders are only lending for uh, business purposes. So for, you know, buying as an investment where non QM, there's a, you know, there's a, uh, a whole portfolio of loans that are available and one being to live in it and one, you know, being, you know, investment and flipping and so on and so forth. So hard money is, um, I would dare say your, your last resort, um, but it is an option and it's a way to get in, especially if you have the ability to buy at a steep, steep discount. Mm-hmm. Cash is obviously the, I would think. Cash is always king. <laughs> cash is king. You would, ah. you would, everybody would love to have all of this cash running or like running yeah. around the money tree out in the backyard so that they can take it to invest. Um, so we're thinking 
cash, obviously, than maybe this non-QM product, which... Pete could do a whole, we could do a whole radio show on what he presented the other day. It's just, it was mind blowing to me and I'm kind of really excited to see how I can get involved and um, how we can use this product to really help a lot of people who weren't able to purchase before, like entrepreneurs he was talking about. And to help us buy real estate. To help us buy real estate, us entrepreneurs, us, us 1099 people over here. Yeah. Um, and I think that was what the, the purpose of those loans uh, coming into fruition was, was to help folks that, you know, they can pay a mortgage, but they simply don't look good with an underwriter, you know, 1099s, writing things off, so on and so forth. But yeah. you know what I'd like to talk about is yeah. is how to find some of these properties, like different ways. You know, we have the talk, we talked about distress, right? You drive around the neighborhood and you see, you know, long grass, broken windows and all that you know, that's one way and knock on the door, but the others, you know, there's foreclosures, right? There was a moratorium through COVID, but they're starting to come up again. And, yeah. you know, if people have the stomach for it, we did a video on this recently, um, buying at foreclosure, you know, there are great opportunities there. You know, you're, it's challenging for somebody, right? But it's an opportunity for a real estate investor. And a lot of times the foreclosure, the the debtor, the person who failed to pay the bank has moved on, right? So that asset needs to change hands and they do it through an auction process. So if you, uh, you know, had the stomach and the desire and you really did your homework to understand exactly what this asset was worth, worst case scenario, what needs to be done to it, you can go and you can bid on that property as the lender uh, exercises their rights to redeem the property for failure to pay. So okay. mortgage foreclosures, I think, are going to be a huge boom in the next couple of years for real estate investors. We've had uh, clients who their business is buying at foreclosure. And for the last two years, there were there was none. So you can yeah. imagine that banks are, are ready to accelerate on those. And then there's the REO, real estate owned portfolio, right? So after the foreclosure auction happens, if the bank can't convince somebody from the general public, a third party to purchase at auction, then it goes back into the bank's portfolio and they become the seller. They sell the property out of their own portfolio. And that is a little less risky for an investor because they actually get to do a home inspection. They get to visit the property and they get to determine whether or not the property is vacant. Because one thing you cannot do is buy a property at auction or bank owned with the former owner in it because uh -huh. the title insurance companies won't allow you to insure it and you will more than likely find yourself in court with somebody challenging challenging the foreclosure so if if we can leave here with any um advice if you buy a foreclosure make sure that uh the property is vacant and there's not somebody living in it that is actually really really good advice and mark just because i heard the final bell so i can't believe it's already over i feel like i still have so many questions but i want you to give your contact and out um your contact information obviously like you said at the beginning of the show you are a real estate investor yourself you work with real estate investors so if anybody has any questions i want them to be able to get in touch with you yeah, so the best way is to call us at 781-319-1900. I do have a Calendly link. If anyone's familiar with Calendly, I've blocked off times to talk to people with no commitment. Amazing. It's calendly.com uh, forward slash M styles. And what I would encourage uh, listeners to do is to go to our YouTube page. We have a YouTube page at Styles Law. And if you type in real estate investor or foreclosure, we've got videos where we talk about all of this fun stuff. So check that out at YouTube at Styles Law. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's um, fun. Sam, give out your contact information. Before you do that, one tip, one tip for everybody who wants to get started in real estate invest investing. What's like your top tip? Um, for me, uh, kind of to Mark's point earlier in finding a deal, um, I like driving for dollars. So if you drive around a neighborhood, you look for that beat up house that has the car that's been sitting there for 20 years, write down the address and then do what's called a skip trace. Try and find out who the owner is, see if you can get in contact with them and see if they're willing to, to do a deal with you. People should contact you for that because I feel like that's very <laughs> high level. So if they want to get in touch with you, how are they getting in touch with you? Um, so you can uh, reach me on, at the Boston Connect website, which is 
www.bostonconnect.com. <laughs> um, I'm one of the agents there. Uh, my cell is 718-789-8366. You can call or text anytime. I don't answer after 10, though. So you can I'll, also I'll call get you in back touch the next with day. us, and we'll get you in touch yes, with Sam. <laughs> absolutely. Or you can email directly at sam period horton at bostonconnect.com. Wow. My mind's about to burst, guys, with all, with all of this. Um, I'm excited. I think, to your point, Mark, um, it's it's challenging that foreclosures are potentially going, we're going to start seeing them more and more um, because the moratorium has be, have been lifted, but it does provide opportunities and as well as I am, now that I'm kind of getting into the real estate investing world with you over here, um, I'm seeing kind of, I'm seeing the light. I'm coming to the dark side or the light side. I'd like to credit Mark too, because I've heard him say foreclosures are coming probably about like a year and a half ago. He's like, they're on the rise. They're coming. Just wait. They are. They are. And it's going to create more inventory too, because your flippers are going to take those, add value and put them back into the market. So that's going to be a positive too. Yep. So the future is looking bright for real estate investors. Right, I think it's I think it's about to come for the real estate investors. We could potentially do a, one thing that we didn't get to tonight that I wanted to get to was how um, people are taking title. So what's the best way? And maybe that's a little bit more of a high level. Is it in an LLC? Is it um, in a biz? Uh, not a business. In a trust, or is it in their name? And I think that maybe the levels kind of change as you go. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways. And I, I heard uh, Sam talk about Delaware corporations and LLCs. But I think that the one thing that most people forget about, and it's relatively inexpensive, is an umbrella policy. Get with your, real, your insurance uh, agent and get an umbrella policy that covers everything. And, uh, you know, the entities aren't as important. I think it's a good idea to separate it from your individual names but the if you have a solid umbrella policy then you should be covered thank you mark and thank you sam for joining us that's our show for tonight guys and have a great night thank you thanks mark thanks sorry that's